am Dr. John Newfeld, and welcome to Back to the Bible Canada. It's a delight to see you, and I, I hope you're doing well. I don't know how long you've been uh, stuck in your house. I've been uh, in my house for a long time, um, but I pray that you know that Christ is still Savior and Lord over all, that he who governs the universe is also a God of love. And so take heart during these days. Uh, don't be overly discouraged. Uh, continue to trust in the Lord. Um, I've decided that I would do a series from the book of Revelation during these days. I think it's an important series to do. Um, and one of the reasons I think it's important is because a great many people have wondered, um, is the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, is this a part of an end time scenario? Um, and, I, and I hope to give a realistic hope into your own life. I hope you look at the book of Revelation with new eyes. I hope you see it the way in which it was written and you develop a biblicist faith, not a reactionary or an extremist faith. I say those words uh, very gently, but I wanna say them with a great deal of fervor as well. We need to be very careful when we speak about the coming of the Lord that we actually know what we're talking about. Well, where do we begin? I, I wanna begin with a, uh, with a quote from Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who Cori Ten Boom was, she was a survivor of the Nazi death camps. Uh, Cori and her family were Dutch. Um, they were hiding Jews in their home when they were arrested, sent to a concentration camp, and she is the only one of her family who survived. Um, later on in her life, uh, she became a marvelous advocate for the gospel deep concern over the salvation of people, and also at the same time, an advocate for forgiveness and reconciliation. Um, but here's something that Corey Ten Boom once said about worry. She said, when I worry, I go to the mirror and I say to myself, this tremendous thing which is worrying me is beyond a solution. It is especially too hard for Jesus Christ to handle. And after I have said that, I smile, and I am ashamed. <laughs> yeah, you know, worry is a lack of confidence um, in Jesus himself. Um, it is a lack of confidence in his rulership over the world, that he is king and Lord over all. It is this idea that the world is out of control and that Romans 8, 28 must not be true, that God causes all things, and I mean all things, to work together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It is to mistrust that God has an absolutely perfect eternity plan for us and only allows those things into our lives which he deems necessary for his glory and our long-term good. When we discount that, worry overwhelms us and I do want to speak to that. Now, uh, I've said I want to do something on Revelation, and uh, I've called this uh, series uh, uh, To the One Who Is Lord Over All. Uh, i got to say it here. To the One Who Conquers. It's, um, it's a tribute to Jesus. It's what he does. Well, I want to say something about the end times because a number of people have asked questions about COVID-19, and uh, they've said things like, um, we know that the government has wanted to make sure that in order to enforce uh, the proper rules uh, around you know, social distancing and, uh, and, uh, and keeping ourselves in our home, all that kind of stuff, uh, they've said, well, you know, maybe we need to track people's movements. And just to be clear here, I, I don't like the government tracking my movements. I love the idea of freedom. Uh, I love the idea of uh, being allowed to say what I want to and to go where I want to uh, and to do so for the glory of God without the government having to ask me to give an account of myself. I, I, I count it a privilege to live in a country that doesn't have that and I would certainly rebel or at least um, I, I would be submissive to the government but I would do everything that I can to make a statement that I don't think that's required. I think the government can do a number of other things to make sure that we keep quarantine restrictions in place. But having said all of that, uh, I want to say something about the end times. Because I've heard a number of people now saying, you know, this COVID-19 is part of an end time scenario. So let me breathe a bit of realism into this. I'm going to tell you about um, three plagues that have struck the human race. One was in AD 250 to 271. It's a period of about 20 years. 
and it's been called the, the plague of Cyprian. And the reason it's called the plague of Cyprian is because Cyprian had nothing to do with it, but Cyprian was a Christian bishop in Carthage who wrote a great deal about that plague. It was a plague that in Rome itself was killing 5,000 people every day in a time when its population was so much smaller than today. Uh, the, the plague was found in faraway Carthage or what we would call Tunisia today. Uh, they have done uh, digs in Luxor. Um, and uh, Luxor is down in the south of Egypt. It was one of the head, head uh, quarters of Egypt. Uh, it's down on the Nile River. And in Luxor, they found huge mass burial sites from all the plague victims during that plague in 250. Uh, let me tell you about the Black Death for seven years, 1346 to 1353. It came from Asia into Europe. Sounds familiar story. Uh, it killed about 50% of all Europeans over a period of seven years. The death just carried on. Uh, let me tell you about the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918 probably killed somewhere around 60 million people worldwide. 60 million. That's more people than died from both world wars. The fact is that there have, numerous, there have been numerous times throughout history uh, when great plagues have, have, um, have decimated the human race, have done huge damage to us. Um, so we need to recognize that this is a part of living in a fallen world. Is this a sign of the end times? The answer is nobody knows that. God knows it. We certainly do not. And no, the Bible does not predict the coronavirus. And we need to get that through our heads. And we need to be calm throughout all of this. I've said it before, but we need to be people of prayer. Uh, we need to be praying regularly uh, for uh, God's attending grace, especially to those, as I understand it, more than 70 labs around the world that are working furiously on this. We would ask that God in mercy allow for there to be a, a, um, a, some kind of an opportunity for us to escape what could be a very ravaging plague, however long it takes. But let's also be calm in our spirits and let's remember. Let's also, I, I'm talking about the book of Revelation because I think the book of Revelation will give us a great deal of hope. Now, you and I know that when we talk about the book of Revelation, we're talking about a book that deals with the future. Uh, it's dealing about a time in which we know that a series of events will begin to spiral and then Christ will come again at the end of the age and he will bring in his perfect reign of righteousness. So it's a very hopeful book that the future belongs to Christ and that we need not fear that the future will somehow, you know, go off the rails and, and, and lead into bad places. We know that Christ holds all things in his hand. Let me also tell you a little bit more about this book. Revelation, if you don't know it, was written by uh, John, who is one of the disciples or was one of the disciples of Jesus. He was one of the 12. We also know that John wrote the book of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. These books are all in our Bible. Um, many people reading Revelation say, yeah, but Revelation just sounds so different than the Gospel of John. Can it actually have been written by the, by the same person? Well, the answer is, it, it's fascinating to me to find out how often uh, in the book of, uh, of John, the number seven comes up. So for instance, uh, in, we have seven I am sayings in the book of John. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, you are the branches. Seven times in John, Jesus begins a statement in which he identifies himself with the words, I am, seven times. I notice also that in uh, the book of John, there are seven signs. I mean, John uh, doesn't refer to the miracles as miracles. He refers to them as signs because they tell us or they're a signpost pointing to a greater reality. 
But he tells us seven signs that Jesus did. Water into wine, healing of the official son, healing at the pool of Bethesda, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, healing a man born blind, and then raising Lazarus from the dead. Those are the seven signs that you will find in the book of John. Now, there are a number of other people that have pointed out that in John, you're gonna find the number seven coming up a number of other times. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are patterns in the book of John that you also find in the book of Revelation. You know, the book of Revelation, there are sevens, they pop up all over the place. There are seven churches, uh, there are seven spirits, there are seven stars, there are seven seals, there are seven trumpets, there are seven bowls, there are seven eyes, there are seven angels, there are seven hills. I mean, seven, seven, seven just comes pouring out in Revelation. And it's an important number because the number seven has a symbolic significance. Uh, John's not saying, for instance, in the book of John, that Jesus only did seven miracles. Uh, John's very clear that Jesus did a great deal more than what he recorded in the book of John. But the number seven speaks about completion, speaks about perfection, speaks about something being entirely done. In other words, when John in the book of John tells us that Jesus did seven signs, he says these are indicative of the perfect signs that Jesus did that perfectly revealed the Father and perfectly revealed God's plan for the world. And that's what we find in the book of Revelation as well. John is writing and he uses some very familiar ways of writing. One of those familiar ways is the number seven. Well, I've said enough about that, but that's one of the ways that we're gonna to get to know this amazing book called the book of Revelation. Well, we know that the book of Revelation was written by John and it's written to a series of seven churches. Now, you know, it's an interesting thing and we're gonna look at those seven churches as we go through this, but the seven churches were all in what was called the Roman province of Asia Minor. Now, you know, place names change over the years. And so if you think about the Roman province of Asia Minor, it would be almost exactly the same of what we might think today as the nation of Turkey. Um, by the time John wrote Revelation, it's about 95, let's say AD 95. Um, and, and by that time, Jerusalem has already been destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. And so it was left a ruin. The temple was burned to the ground. Uh, we also know that the Jews were horribly persecuted. A great many of them had been slaughtered, been killed, and they had been driven all over the place. And so the center of the Christian faith was no longer in Jerusalem by the time of this writing. And we also know that by the time of this writing, John had been settled in Ephesus for some time, and that Ephesus had become the center of the Christian world um, in AD 95. So think about it this way. John is writing to seven churches. He, at this time of writing, is exiled by the Roman emperor Domitian. I'll say a little bit about, more about that. And, and Domitian has exiled him to an island called Patmos, just off the, the coast of what we think of Turkey today. And um, uh, Patmos was a penal colony, and he's left there, and he writes a letter to seven churches. And if you can imagine a map of Turkey, and you can imagine that Ephesus is here, and then all of the other churches, it goes around in a circle. So it, it, it is a letter that's written to seven churches, but because the number of churches is seven, we have to believe that John is telling us something about what this letter actually means. Yeah, it's addressed to seven real historic churches who had a real historic life, who had problems and had opportunities, to whom Jesus had something to say. But because the number is exactly seven, we also know that number speaks about completion or perfection, and therefore we might say, this book has something to say to the complete number of all of God's churches throughout all of history. Even though it was written to a direct group of people, it speaks directly to us today. So let me stop there for a moment and tell you a little bit more about Revelation. See, I know that a great many of us, when we think about Revelation, you know, we're thinking about, you know, there's images and Revelation and things that are hard to understand. 
Um, we see the breaking of seals and the pouring out of bowls of wrath, and we see a beast rising up with, with seven horns, and we, and we see all sorts of other things happening. And we wonder to ourselves, I mean, what's going on? I don't think I understand the images. And some of us are left confused and wondering what it's all about. But, but let me say this at the outset. The way to understand Revelation is in some sense, the way in which we understand all Bible books that we read. So for instance, let's say you're studying the book of Philippians. Well, the first question would be, who wrote it? Answer, Paul wrote Philippians. To whom did he write the letter? Well, he wrote it to a church in Philippi, which was a large Greek city in the north of Greece. Okay, Uh, what were these people like? And then we find out what the message meant to them at the time and when it was written. And then after we've discovered that, we make application to our own lives today. That's how we read the book of Revelation. Ask yourself what the message of Revelation would have meant to these seven churches. How would it have encouraged them? How would it have helped them to understand their world and their situation? And then ask yourself, how can we apply that to our lives today? And that's the approach that I'm going to take. Revelation has everything in the world to do with what was happening to those seven churches and what God wanted them to know. From that, God has something to say to us, how we can have hope in difficult times, how we can look to the future and recognize that Christ is coming. Okay, that's something I wanted to say. Well, it's written to seven churches. They're in the nation of what we call Turkey today, and they were suffering persecution. Uh, Something unique had happened during the time of Revelation, so it's AD 95, and um, the Roman emperor at the time is a man by the name of Domitian. Domitian was the first emperor to proclaim himself a god and demand worship of himself. His holy temple was in Rome, and there, as historians tell us, he defiled all pure worship and insisted Um, that there would be death to anyone who refused to offer sacrifices to him as a god. Well, as you can only imagine, that put Christians, who were by then still a small minority, made up primarily of of the poor. A great many slaves were believers. Uh, Not a great many noble and uh, powerful people had been Christians yet. And so the church seemed powerless and helpless against the imperial might of Rome. You would think that Rome would steamroll over that infant church and there'd be nothing left. So you have to imagine uh, being a, uh, a believer in one of these seven churches. When you begin to hear the proclamation of Domitian, you might say, what's going to happen to us? I mean, is the emperor going to destroy us utterly? Will we all be killed? Will there be anything left of the Christian church? Is the gospel going to die at this point in time? And that's exactly what some Christians would have thought. See, in one sense, the terrible things that you find in Revelation do correspond to some of the terrible things that Christians were facing at that point in time. So in that sense, we need to understand that the book of Revelation spoke directly to them, but because the number is seven churches, we know it's speaking directly to us today as well. When we're going through difficult times, and many of us are recognizing that, you know, the world has changed in a very short order. Just a few months ago, everything was going on as before, and suddenly we find our borders closed, we're locked inside of our houses, all schools are closed, we're not able to meet together as churches. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, and we can hardly believe this is happening. If you told me a couple of months ago that this was going to occur, I would have probably said, you're being an alarmist. But how suddenly the world changes and how suddenly the skies become dark. What will happen to us now? The book of Revelation has so much to teach us. So Christians of all ages look back at this book and they see something that looks eerily similar to their own time period. You know, I've heard all sorts of uh, prophecy specialists already say, you know, uh, this coronavirus uh, is prophesied in the Bible. It fits right in line with scripture. Well, a part of me wants to say posh and rubbish And another part of me wants to say, well, that's because every time period in which Christians have lived has looked eerily similar to some of the things that are described in the book of Revelation. 
The, the point of revelation is not to identify where our time period fits in the grand scheme of things, but it's to recognize that whenever we're going through unsettling times, it tells us that a great unsettledness is going to happen in the future. It's called the Great Tribulation. There's going to be a time when evil reaches a zenith and we'll wonder what in the world will be happening. And yet we need to remember that, you know, the one who conquers, well, you know, it's not the Roman emperor. You know, Domitian is not Lord and King. He's not King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It is Jesus Christ who is greater than Domitian. And for that reason, I'm gonna take you through um, a, a bit of um, uh, an outline of Revelation. I try to help us to understand what we're gonna be reading when we read through this and uh, to help us to understand some of the mystery of this wonderful book. So here, here's an outline and you might wanna take notes and if you need to you know, press pause on the odd occasion and simply take some notes, you go ahead and do that. Um, Revelation chapter one, verse one, all the way to verse eight kind of forms the introduction to the book. Uh, we have the opening of the letter and the theme of the letter, especially in verses seven and eight, we have the theme, behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the almighty. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Jesus, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is coming soon. That's the beginning of the book that opens up the scene for us. And then with that, we have the first vision in the book. And in the first vision, we find that Christ is speaking to seven churches. Um, so uh, it begins simply by giving us a description of the glory of Jesus who speaks. And then the message he has to churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, seven churches in seven cities in Asia Minor. And Jesus has a word for all seven of these churches. Um, he is, as it is, um, wandering among the lampstands. The lampstands are a reference to the churches. He's wandering among the churches. His eyes are like blazing fire. He looks acutely and he is aware of everything that's happening in the churches. You know, and just like today, not all churches are the same. Some are doing remarkably well, and some are doing remarkably badly. Some are sinning, and some are falling into malaise and lapsing from their faith, and some are going forward in great energy, and some are in between somewhere. And that's exactly what we're gonna find out when Jesus speaks to the seven churches. He is speaking to the things that he affirms in a church, and he rebukes things in a local church as well. And we ought to read this with great interest, because the one who rules from on high has something to say to his local church. Well, after we've done that, then suddenly the scene changes and it changes in chapter four. When we come to chapter four, John is suddenly says, he hears a voice from heaven and the voice says, come up here. And John is suddenly taken into the throne room of God himself. He explains what happens in the throne room of God and it's overwhelming, it should, you know, leave us gobsmacked. Uh, you know, our jaws should have dropped open and we should have said, oh my goodness, this is what's going on. This is the throne room of God. I'll tell you what that would have meant to the seven churches. The seven churches were so aware of the throne room in Rome. They were so aware of the decrees of Domitian and what he said and what he did and how it might affect them and the persecution they might have to endure. That filled their imagination, and I have no doubt it filled some of their fear, but some of those who were strong in faith were determined to go forward. But suddenly, when their eyes were fixed on what Domitian was doing next, and how he had caused them to suffer, suddenly the scene changes, and John says, let me take you to another throne room. It's a throne room that you've heard of before, but let me describe it to you, and once I've described it, it will make Domitian seem like a, a small, paltry player who says nothing at all because Jesus himself rules over him. So that's uh, Revelation chapter four, this amazing scene that moves from the hard-pressed and persecuted church in the local level to the throne room of heaven. 
And then after that, after we've seen this throne room in heaven and with all the the angelic beings crying out, holy, holy, holy to the Lord, all ready to do the bidding, suddenly in chapter five, when we come to it, John writes, then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So he sees in the hand of the one seated on the throne, God himself, a scroll. Now, as we continue to read, we soon begin to understand what the scroll is. The scroll depicts the destiny of the earth. The scroll depicts God's plan for the earth. You know, as Moses was said, one day the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is God's plan to fill this earth with his glory, to consummate everything this earth was created for. This is God's plan to bring all things in subjection to himself. And yet we find also that the scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, if you can imagine an ancient scroll, and usually on an ancient scroll, you'd roll it up, and it would probably be a message, let's say, that comes from a king, and it would be rolled up, and it would have a, a wax seal on it, and on the seal, the, 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 the king would put an imprint of his ring, so that if you broke the seal, uh, you know it had been broken and already read. So the king would send this uh, to someone and they would not be able to open the, the seal because it had to go to the person whom it had to be sent to. It was, it was security in the ancient day. But this one comes and on the top of it, you can imagine not one seal, but seven seals that are affixed to it. And then a loud voice comes from heaven and says, who is worthy to break the seal? and open the scroll and enact the plan of God throughout history. And John says, I began to weep because who is worthy to enact God's plan for the world? No one is worthy who can break this seal. Will it be that God's plan for this world will remain sealed forever? And so I'm reading Revelation chapter five, verse four. And it says, and I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and look into it. And one of the elders, and we'll find out about the elders, we read about them in chapter 4, said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. In other words, listen, Jesus himself, uh, the one who comes from the line of David, the one who is destined to rule over all of this earth, he is worthy to take the scroll from the hands of the one seated on the throne and to break the seals and enact God's plan and bring all things into conformity with the plan of God. Ask yourself again what that would have meant to the seven churches. They're worshipers of Jesus. Did you know who he is? He's the one who takes God's instruction manual from the Father's hands, and he enacts the purposes of God in human history until the consummation of all things, and when Jesus reigns supreme as King and King and Lord of Lords, at that point in time, all things are made exactly as God had destined them to be. All things are well. Christ has taken the scroll. And so they would have been encouraged. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're worshiping one who's king and Lord. And then with that, we come to chapter six. And that's um, one of these, uh, there's three patterns, the breaking of seven seals, uh, the, uh, the sounding of seven trumpets, and the, uh, and the pouring out of seven bowls. And I'll say a little bit about that in a while, but that's how we find the book of Revelation unfolding. So when we come to chapter six, uh, John writes, now I watched when the lamb, it's a reference to Jesus, opened one of the seven seals. After the breaking of the seven seals, we have the sounding of seven trumpets. And from my vantage point, that introduces us to what we might call the great tribulation. Uh, the trumpet sounds, the seven trumpets then sound. And then after seven trumpets sound, then come seven significant visions that explain to us the spiritual reality behind all of this. We have a vision of a woman and a dragon. Then number two, we have a vision of Satan being cast down to earth and explains to us the spiritual warfare that's going on in the earth today. Vision number three is a war between Satan and the woman. And I'm not gonna explain who the woman is right now. It just takes too long. Then vision number four, the rising of two beasts 
which is a rising of the Antichrist. Then vision number five, we have the Lamb, who is Jesus, on Mount Zion, surrounded by 144,000. Then vision number six, we have a message from three angels. And then we have vision number seven, which is a harvest of all the earth, as finally Jesus himself harvests the earth. And that's the destiny of all things. And then having given us these seven visions of the significant spiritual battle that's going on, then comes the seven bowls of God's judgment. And at this point in time, it is a time for God to bring judgment on the earth at the end of the age, which he certainly will. Now with all of this, finally we come to a depiction from chapter 17 pretty well to the end of the book, which is a depiction of the final triumph of the Lamb. We're going to see a spiritual depiction of Babylon, which is the city of man, and how Babylon will be utterly destroyed. We'll get a picture of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll get a picture of a rider on a white horse. We'll get a picture of a millennial kingdom, and then the final defeat of Satan, then the last judgment, and then a new heaven and a new earth in which all things are made new. That's where we're heading. So think back to those seven churches in Revelation. It would have been very easy for them to say, you know, we're really nothing. Um, the great power centers of the world, the great armies of the world, uh, the force of history in the world belongs to other people, not us. You know, we're just one religion who happened to work, worship Jesus, and I guess that's who we are. But the book of Revelation is written to say, oh no, that's, that's, that's not so. All of history revolves around Jesus Christ, who is Lord over all, who is right now watching over his church to protect and defend it and to give it hope and courage because the future belongs to the church of Jesus Christ. All world history, when it eventually is written, will tell the story of a triumphant lamb and a triumphant people whom he has redeemed. That's what this book is all about. See, and that's why when we go through difficult times and when we see that the world is trembling, we'll say, well, we always knew that the world wasn't going to last forever. We always knew that this was a fallen creation, that it was, you know, it was at, at, odds, at, at, at odds with God himself. We recognize that the world is populated by rebels who will not bend the knee to their creator. We, we, we know that. But we will not fear because the future is in the hands of Jesus. He is the one who breaks the seals and opens the book. He is the one who unfolds God's destiny. And he is the one who redeems the people unto himself. The future is not in the palaces in Rome. And to put it into our day, the future doesn't happen to be in Beijing or in Washington or in London or whatever other power centers there are in the world. The future, the future is among the people of God. If you want to know what's going to happen, have a look at Christ's church. Have a look at the church that loves him and recognize these, these are the dealings of God. So I invite you over the next, I think it's going to be about seven weeks, I think. I'm going to take you all through the way through the first seven chapters of Revelation and give you a taste of this remarkable book. You know, because we're living in remarkable times, it's a time to re-energize our hope. It's a time to remember that Jesus is in control. It's a time to read with great care what has been written in the book of Revelation and then again find great courage and say, Oh Lord, it is true. The future is yours and I am yours as well. Well, thanks for watching Back to the Bible today. Um, I'd like you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Uh, for God's people, many of who are staying at home during this time. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord God, give us courage, uh, give us hope, uh, make us people of love, help us to care for our neighbors, help us to do all those things that bring you glory and uh, is also for the good of mankind. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this amazing book of Revelation. And as we study it over the next several weeks, I pray, O oh Lord God, open our eyes so that we may see. Again, thanks for joining us here at Back to the Bible. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Be encouraged.